one of the biggest names at the wide receiver position is currently available in free agency. Should the Jets be interested in DeAndre Hopkins? I say yes, and I'll explain why today on Locked On Jets. You are Locked On Jets, your daily New York Jets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome, this is the Locked On Jets podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's Wednesday, June 7th, 2023, and I'm your host, John B. from GangGreenNation.com. Thanking you for making this show your first listen or first watch every day. Subscribe to the show for free on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts so that you get new episodes as soon as they're posted. If you're listening on a podcast source and enjoy what you hear, give the show a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, give this episode a big thumbs up. This helps us out and helps other Jets fans find the show. Today's episode of Locked On Jets is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash NFL, and when you enter promo code LOCKEDONNFL, they will throw in a free custom Bird Dogs Yeti-style tumbler with every order. Today we have our weekly mailbag show. Thanks to everybody who sent in questions. Each Wednesday we try and do a mailbag with listener questions. Let's begin. Our first question is from Chris. Hey there, John. I would love to hear your views on the DeAndre Hopkins situation. It seems like the Jets are suggesting that they want to go with the current wide receiver group as is. Do you think that's a mistake? It looks like they could currently fit him in, especially if they let go of Corey Davis. Do you think that they should get him? Also, do you think that they will get him? So good question there by Chris. And DeAndre Hopkins is available. The Cardinals cut him loose last week. Do I think the Jets should go after DeAndre Hopkins? The answer to that is yes. So here's how I view the current Jets wide receiver group. And I'm just going to take a moment to enjoy this. This podcast has existed since 2016. I think this is the first time I've ever been able to say this on Locked On Jets. The New York Jets have a bona fide number one receiver. Now, I may have been able to say that in 2016 because we were still coming off the Brandon Marshall big year, but Brandon Marshall did not play like a number one receiver in 2016. So this is the first time I I go into a season, and I know I'm going to be able to say during a season the Jets have a bona fide number one receiver. That's Garrett Wilson. Outstanding rookie last year. A guy who I'm just so excited to watch him as his career develops. In fact, this is kind of a microcosm for the full season, because I'm just going to try and enjoy this season this year. I told you, this podcast has been going on since 2016. I've not been able to watch a good Jets team in all the years we've done this. So let's just enjoy this. Let's enjoy the fact we have Garrett Wilson, who's going to be number one receiver. So that's, he's at the top, you got a go-to guy. And that's a big deal. I think sometimes we sell short in the NFL how much of an impact top-end talent makes. A great player in the NFL makes a big difference. So just having Garrett Wilson means that your receiving core is pretty solid to begin with. Now, after Garrett Wilson, it's interesting because you have a bunch of guys who are NFL-caliber players. And again, all the years I've done this show, there have been a lot of receivers for the Jets who may or may not have belonged in the NFL. We got a lot of NFL caliber receivers after Garrett Wilson. Corey Davis, if he can find that Tennessee form again, and I think part of the re- problem with Corey Davis, he's, he's been a disappointment his first two years with the team. A lot of it's just been he's had, the, he's had trouble staying on the field. So I know you could say this about a lot of guys, but if Davis stays on the field, he could be a good number two receiver. He could be a good second option behind Garrett Wilson. He's not a go-to guy. I think part of the problem is when the Jets brought him in, Maybe they sold the idea he was going to be a go-to guy, and he's not. That's not what he is. But as a second option, I don't think he's terrible, especially if he can find that Tennessee form. You know, in Tennessee, he was good in the intermediate game. He was good at contested catches. So behind Garrett Wilson, peak Corey Davis is pretty solid. After that, you have Alan Lazard, who I think slots into the third role. I'll tell you something about Alan Lazard that you probably don't realize. He's going to play the slot a lot more than people think. Nathaniel Hackett likes to go big in the slot. And I think part of it's he likes to have a big guy in the middle of the field who can help with the run blocking. He plays his tight ends in the slot a lot. He'll, I think Alan Lazard also saw a fair amount of time in the slot in Green Bay. You know, in the NFL, a lot of us think of slot receivers like little guys who are quick in short space. Jamison Crowder is one. Braxton Berrios is another. And for that reason, you see a lot of slot corners in this league who are smaller, who are quicker. So there's been this movement in the NFL to counter that by getting a little bit bigger in the slot on offense, create a mismatch. If there's a little guy at that corner, put a big guy there to uh, help out in that area. So Alan Lazard's going to play a decent amount of slots. Um, behind him, Randall Cobb. I, I'll, if you listen to the show, you know I was not a fan of signing Randall Cobb. Here's what I'll say about Randall Cobb. Here's the counter to my argument. I'll give you, I'll give you both sides of the argument. I, I think Cobb is finished. 
If you're looking for the glasses half full view on Cobb, though, I think it would be that he's got good chemistry with Aaron Rodgers. And even though Cobb used to be a very talented player, Cobb was a guy I wanted on the Jets for quite a while. Now at this point of his career, his skills are really diminished, but chemistry with your quarterback can make up to a certain extent for a lack of skills. So I think that's the glasses half full case with Cobb. Behind him, we have Mecole Hardman. Now, I won't lie to you about Mecole Hardman. After the Cobb signing, the addition of Hardman made much less sense to me. Because now he's kind of in that Braxton Berrios role where he's going to be a gadget guy, he's going to be a backup, maybe he'll be a return guy. Jets are paying him a lot of money for that role. It's kind of like they did with Berrios. And he's a depth player, and I think he maybe adds a deep dimension that Berrios did not. But he's a quality NFL player, and if he's your fifth option, maybe the idea was we're going to add as much depth as possible. This is a receiving core you can talk yourself into. It's a receiving core that's got a higher floor than pretty much any Jets receiving group in a long time. I was going to say last half decade, but it goes further than that, just because you have a number one in Garrett Wilson, and you have quality pieces behind him. What I worry about, though, is what happens if Garrett Wilson gets injured. Because then you, you've got a dicey situation. Then I think either Corey Davis or Alan Lazard, your number one receiver, if you're trying to compete for a championship this year, I don't know that that's what you want. So while this receiving core on paper is, is you know, you could say it's good enough. It's good enough if you don't want to be bad. Is it good enough to win a championship? Well, that's where DeAndre Hopkins could come in. Because even though, even if DeAndre Hopkins is not the, like, they, that first team all pro he was back in his Houston days, I still think he's playing at a pretty high level. I think behind Garrett Wilson, if you saw him as the second receiver, he's a great number two right now, even in, even as he's on the wrong side of 30. And I think DeAndre Hopkins only makes sense for a certain type of team because he is on the wrong side of 30, and he's not the peak player he used to be. But he still can play. And if anything was to happen to Garrett Wilson, then you slot Hopkins, and he's, I think you could still make a case he's a number one type receiver. I think the other aspect of this, as Chris mentioned, is... The finances. Corey Davis kind of has a hold right now. The Jets can cut him loose and make you know, over $10 million of cap space. So while the Jets are tied up against the cap, now I know somebody's going to say the Jets currently have $25 million in cap space. Technically, that's true. But that's also if we're assuming Aaron Rodgers is making $1.2 million this year. I don't think that's going to happen. I could, I've been wrong on a lot this offseason, so maybe Rodgers just said I'm fine making $1.2 million. I would assume that a good chunk of that money, though, is going to lead going to be spent on Rodgers once he redoes, does his contract and his cap number goes up. But at the wide receiver position, you kind of have this situation with Davis where you can cut him loose, and that pays for a lot of Hopkins. Hopkins' deal probably would have to be backloaded to a certain extent just because the Jets are kind of tied up against the cap. But I do think that Davis's deal would pay for a lot of it. So maybe at the wide receiver position, unlike any other spot, the Jets could afford this. So it's an interesting, interesting spot. But to me, this is the type of situation where it just makes sense because you're kind of all in right now. I mean, if people try and say the Jets aren't all in, they just gave up a first round pick and a second round pick for a 39 year old quarterback. If that's not all in, what's the what's all in? And I think that you're trying to look, you're not you're building to try and win a Super Bowl this year. You don't go out and get Aaron Rodgers to you know have a winning record. There are other quarterbacks that could have got you a winning record. And I think Hopkins, at this time of year, there really are not many impact players available. And even if DeAndre Hopkins is not the guy he was at his peak, he still can help a team out a lot, I think. So I think that this would be a very logical move for the Jets. Will they get him? There's really been no buzz behind it. So even though I think it would be a good move, I don't know that the Jets are in that mindset right now. It, there's really hasn't been much talk about the Jets going out to get Hopkins. There have been rumors about Hopkins for a long time this offseason. We kind of knew Arizona was moving on early in the offseason. And there were other teams that, you know, there was talk about Kansas City. There was talk about Buffalo. He's meeting with the Tennessee Titans. There's really been no talk about the, the Jets. All well, the talk was about Odell Beckham Jr. So I don't know whether the Jets are actually interested. I would be, though. Now, head here on the Lockdown Jets podcast. We'll continue our offseason talk. Even though there's not a lot going on, there are a couple big-name players available. There's also one at the running back position, Dalvin Cook. Could the Jets be on him? Well, I'll give you some thoughts on that as we continue this Wednesday mailbag edition of Lockdown Jets. Today's episode of Lockdown Jets is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Bird Dogs make you look good. Bird Dogs stretch khaki shorts are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. Bird Dog shorts do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but fit way better. 
They fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. Bird Dogs fixed this issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that makes that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. Bird Dogs uses anti-stink sweat, fa- sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. I gotta say, you know, dirt, bird dogs can even make me look good. And I'm, you know, I'm not sure I'm the most fashionable guy, but bird dogs is definitely the way to go. And you should go to birddogs.com slash locked on NFL and enter promo code locked on NFL. That's all one word with no space. L O C K E D O N N F L for a free Yeti style tumbler with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NFL for a free Yeti style tumbler. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. I promise you. Thank you for making Locked On Jets your first listen or first watch every day. We have a fun rest of the week scheduled here on the show. Tomorrow, we are going to take you back to the last good Jets team and discuss one of their greatest victories. That's on tomorrow's edition of Locked On Jets. You everydayers, I can't wait to talk about that game. But today, we're doing our weekly mailbag. Our next question, should the Jets be interested in Dalvin Cook? There's been rumors that he may be on his way out of Minnesota. So Cook, I feel less convinced on. I could go either way on him. Now, one thing I'll say is that I don't think the Jets should trade for Dalvin Cook, especially an early pick. There was one article recently on some website that suggested the Jets giving up a fourth-round pick. Look, the Jets need draft picks. The Jets have already given up a lot of draft picks to get Aaron Rodgers. you got to find some balance in building your team. I don't think that trading a fourth-round pick for a running back who's got some wear on the tires is the right move. I also think the contract needs to make sense. The Jets have backloaded a lot of contracts. They've pushed a lot of guaranteed money to the future. You're all in. You're trying to win the Super Bowl. I understand that. There has to be some degree of balance, though. For a guy who could make a meaningful difference like a DeAndre Hopkins, I can see it. For a running back like Dalvin Cook, I think he makes sense at a certain price. I don't think Dalvin Cook is finished. I mean, I've watched some of his film recently. I think that he's still got speed. He still can make guys miss. If you look at last year, and I I did some research recently on an article I did for Brees Hall, so this is how I figured this out. He's still producing big plays at a pretty pretty big rate. So that's a positive. That's definitely a positive. And one of the things I've come to feel is that at the running back position, your biggest value is can you produce big plays? Because the first, you know, three to four yards, typically you're going to get what's blocked for you or you're not going to get, or if nothing's blocked for you, you're not going to get anything. That's true of most running backs. And I know I'm oversimplifying, but I think generally speaking, that's true. That's more or less true. Right, yards like five to 10, maybe it's part what gets blocked for you. A dominant offensive line can get you more yards. Maybe you can make a linebacker miss or something. Yard 10 and beyond, it's pretty much what you can do with it. And Dalvin Cook, you still see a speed. He can, he, he, he can make guys miss. He can run away from guys. He's still a big play guy, but he's getting older. You know, I, I don't know how much longer he's going to last. You can talk me into it. When you look at this running back position for the Jets, much like wide receiver, there's one great young player in Brees Hall. Oh, I love Brees. Brees is the greatest. My, my, my favorite pick from the 2022 draft. And I'm usually against picking running backs early. But Brees, of course, is coming off injury. So bringing in a, a guy who's a quality starter in Dalvin Cook to maybe take some of the pressure off Brees early while he recovers, make sure he's make sure Brees is at full strength for November, December. I could see it. That makes some sense. On the other hand, you've got some young players. Now, we don't know what Bam Knight's going to produce. There were some very good games for him last year. There were some very bad games. Izzy Abanaconda, I like him for a fifth-round pick. He has a fifth-round pick, though. You know, Michael Carter, I feel like I'm, I'm, the more I think about this, I'm kind of out on Michael Carter. Really disappointed me last year. You could argue he's going to bounce back, though. So there's a case to be made either way for these young running backs. I think Cook maybe gives you more certainty. On the other hand, you see it across the league all the time, some young running back stepping in and making a difference. And you saw that for a couple games last year with Bam Knight, and maybe can the Jets get more consistency. Hopefully their offensive line stays a little bit healthier this year than it was last year. So I guess with Dalvin Cook, it depends on the price for me. I could see it maybe, maybe not. No trade. If you can get him at a reasonable contract, then that makes sense. But... I guess I go back to what I said with Hopkins is that, you know, I, I don't think, I, I think at the end of the day, the Jets will not be in on Hopkins. I'm not sure the Jets will be in. There have been some rumors. I'm not sure they'll be in on Cook because it doesn't seem to me like the Jets are really going to want to invest a ton of money in a, in a veteran running back. And I don't know that Cook wants to go to a place where he's going to be in a, such a timeshare agreement with a Brees Hall. 
So I, I could be wrong on that. Maybe Galvin Cook wants to play with Aaron Rodgers. Maybe he's near the end of his career. He wants to win a Super Bowl. Like Maybe that's the case. I'd be a little surprised, though, if the Jets were in on Cook. Next question. Which of the two would you rather have, Hopkins or Cook? All right, so I've taken you through what the Jets have at receiver and what they have at running back. And I think that behind one great player who's in their second year at both positions, there are lots of question marks. So really it comes down to which of these question marks would I rather roll the dice on? And I think I may have given my answer away a little bit in the previous, uh, in the previous question. I feel like I, I'd be better off sticking with what I got at running back because you do see it across the NFL and a lot of running back success is based on your blocking. So I feel like the odds of, you know, Ibanaconda or Bam Knight, or maybe somebody, you know, maybe even Carter bouncing back. I feel like that's realistic. I, I don't know that it's going to happen. I think Cook would be insurance to make sure that you got quality play out of running back. At the wide receiver position, that's really where I want to upgrade, though, because I feel like the odds of a breakout are much lower. You know, everybody I told you about at the wide receiver position after Garrett they don't really have a lot of ability to be an impact player. I mean, they kind of are who they are at this point in their careers. And they're all NFL players. They'll all give you a certain floor. I think DeAndre Hopkins also gives you a certain floor, but he raises that floor quite a bit. And he gives you kind of perhaps a second go-to guy. So that's, I, I'd prefer Hopkins to the other, to uh, Dalvin Cook. That, that's really where I would go there. Next question, John. One of the big issues the Jets have had for a long time is a lack of explosive plays, probably on both sides of the ball. I'm assuming with Nathaniel Hackett and Aaron Rodgers, this will change quite a bit. What kind of philosophy do you think this offense will take to generate a top-level offense? And do you think this unit can achieve that goal? I still think the Jets are going to be driven by their defense. I, I, I don't think this is like an offense that's just going to play not to lose. I don't think this is going to be like one of those Rex Ryan offenses where the objective is just to not make a mistake. I mean, I don't know if this is a top-level offense. I think the offense could be way better, though. At the quarterback position, you've upgraded from Zach Wilson, Joe Flacco, Mike White trio to Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers is not the Aaron Rodgers of, you know, five years ago. I've been watching some Aaron Rodgers film, and he's still as smart as ever. You know, he still makes good pre-snap reads. He still can scan the entire field. I think there are a couple areas where he's not what he used to be. One of them is that I, I don't think he's quite as mobile. I'm not going to say he's not quite as, he's not as mobile as he used to be. He doesn't move very well. I'm not saying he's Flacco. I'm not saying he's a guy who's incapable of moving, but he used to be able to move with ease. You know, he used to be able, really be able to use his legs to extend plays. He, even though he wasn't a great rusher, he was a guy who could evade the pass rush. I, I don't think he can really, he can move within the pocket to evade the pass rush. I don't think he, he's really that mobile anymore. The second thing is, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm saying. The arm isn't quite as good as it used to be. Now, it's still a good NFL arm. It's still good enough for him to be a good quarterback. I think there are certain throws that he can't make anymore. Certain, like I, I think he makes like the unbelievable throw in the intermediate range still. But at least from what I've seen, and I'm going to keep watching the film... I don't think he makes the spectacular like 30-yard throw as frequently. He can make it occasionally. I don't think he makes it quite as frequently as he used to. So you're getting a, my guess is that you're getting a good play from Rodgers. I don't think you're getting like MVP level play though. Now you've got a couple good pieces on offense around him. You got Garrett Wilson. I've said it over again. I'll keep saying it. I love Garrett Wilson. You got Brees who's coming back from an injury, so maybe you want to take it easy on him early. You got a NFL caliber receiving core, if not a great one. You got an offensive line that's got some question marks. I think this all adds up to a decent offense. And if the Jets defense plays great again this year, their offense will be able to make plays. You know, it's not it's not a case where they're just trying to avoid the mistake. This offense will be able to make plays. And I think it will be an above average unit. I don't think this is necessarily going to be a top five unit unless Brees just has an incredible recovery timeline. Now, by the end of the year, if Brees is back to being Brees... I'm, I'm talking about the full season. I don't, I don't think it's going to be a top five offense through the full season. But if we get to like November, December, and Brees is feeling like himself again, then it could, could start performing like that. And the analogy I might use is a Brett Favre in Minnesota, because Brett Favre had a great year. I think he was around, I think it was actually the same age, age Rodgers is this year in 2000. 2009, Favre was that age. And he had Adrian Peterson to lean on. And that's one of the things that made Favre so good that year. Favre had a great year, but he also had a good running back he could lean on who kind of takes some of the pressure off him. So if that's what happens, if Brees comes back and is healthy, then I think all bets are off. I think the Jets are going to be in really good shape on offense down the stretch. But let's not forget about this defense. I mean, this was a defense that was arguably a top five unit a year ago, 
And it's, I don't think they really lost that many. I don't think they really lost anything of note on that unit. So I think it's going to be a great defense. Let's not sell the defense short. I think this is going to be actually be, and it's crazy to say with Aaron Rodgers, a quarterback, I think this could be a more defense driven team than offense driven team. Now, head here on the Locked Jets podcast. We'll close out our weekly mailbag. We'll talk about the Jets swapping picks in the draft, dropping from 13 to 15. We'll also talk about the decision to cancel veteran minicamp. What do I think about it? Well, I'll tell you what I, I'll tell you what I had here on this Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. This is a Wednesday mailbag edition of the Locked On Jets podcast. Let's continue our next question. Even though I did not like the trade from 13 to 15, I think it does not make any sense the story about Joe Douglas getting caught off guard because the Steelers traded in front of him. You may or may not like JD, but he earned seven figures for being prepared for any possible scenario in the draft, and they even practiced days before. Even pre-draft, there was the possibility the Patriots would take a tackle, and a trade is always a possibility. I understood he took till the last second to make the pick, but I cannot imagine that he was not prepared for what was to come. Let me know your thoughts. I don't know. I mean, I think if you were watching it live, my view was probably that they thought they were going to get Broderick Jones and... They took it down to the last minute. I, I My guess is what happened was Will McDonald was the top player on their board at that point, but they probably felt like they could get McDonald later on. So it seemed like the fact they went to the last minute meant they were trying to trade down. Uh, I don't know that I agree with the premise that because the team has a draft board that there's no way they can be caught on prepared. We've seen this a lot through the years in the NFL, how a team, every team has a draft board. There have definitely been teams that have been caught unprepared during the NFL draft. So it could have happened. I mean, as wa- when I was watching it live, I thought that's what happened. Um, but, you know, I mean, there have been teams that have missed a pick. Those te- I'm sure those teams had a board. And, some t- you know, a team a team has a game plan heading into uh, heading into each game, but there, you still see times where the offensive coordinator kind of, like, loses the thread and makes a, makes a bizarre decision that I'm sure it wasn't something they practiced during the week. You can practice something all you want. In the heat of the moment, you don't know what's going to happen. And I think, it, you know, it, did it happen? I, I don't know. Do I think it matters? I mean, I know the Jets put out this PR video where it made it look like everybody knew exactly what was going on in the background. I think it was, they call it Flight 23. They used to call it One Jets Drive. I mean, I, I don't know that they. If you if you followed those videos through the years, you would have heard that Adam Gase was going to revolutionize offense, and you know the Jets the Jets had a team that was going to be great the last couple of years. So I don't know. I don't know how much I buy into the the, the video the Jets put out on draft day. I think the it doesn't. I, I said this on draft night. I'm not as worried about this as a lot of people were. Like a lot of people were very upset that they missed out on Broderick Jones, but I really felt like Broderick Jones was a guy who was not a, as much of a lock as people were making him out to be. I think he's a guy who needs a lot of work on his game, and I feel like part of the reason people were upset with the Will McDonald pick is just nobody had really heard of him. We no, he wasn't really a player who was on anybody's radar heading into the draft, and I think. During the draft, you get upset. You tend to get upset when your team makes a pick you've never heard of. And people think that he's just not any good. So I'm very wait and see right now. Now, if Broderick Jones turns into a good player and Will McDonald does not, then I think you'll look back on that. You'll say, well, that wasn't such a good move by the Jets. But I think we need to let this play out a little bit because let's just say, let's say hypothetically, the Jets did miss out on Broderick Jones. Let's just say for the sake of argument that the Jets were going to pick Broderick Jones, then that trade down from 13 to 15 cost them Broderick Jones. I've watched the NFL for a long time. I've been through a lot of drafts. And one thing you learn when you watch a lot of drafts is even in situations like that, half the time you end up better off. I mean, I can think of a lot of situations like the Ravens in 2006 were trying to get Brady Quinn. Or it was 07, I'm sorry. They tried to get Brady Quinn, a quarterback out of Notre Dame. It was a total bust. They missed out on him. The next year, they drafted Joe Flacco. Flacco helped them win their second Super Bowl. If they had gotten what they wanted that year, it would have been a disaster for them. Ozzie Newsom may have been fired. We may re- we may remember Ozzie Newsom differently if he had gotten Brady Quinn like he wanted. So, and I've seen cases like this over and over where you think you missed out on a guy, and the guy you, the guy you end up picking ends up better. So, I, I try and relax with the draft. We will be able to make an assessment on this in a few years whether whether or not the Jets made out well. I mean, did they get caught off guard? I mean, watching it live, that's kind of the impression I got, but I don't know. It's, you know, they, they may not have been, you know, maybe, maybe that video was, I mean, I don't trust any, any of these PR videos, but maybe the video was accurate. I, I don't know. But really the question is more, 
will will McDonald pan out? Because honestly, if Will McDonald pans out, if Will McDonald turns into like a nine ten sack a year guy, I don't think you're really going to miss Broderick Jones. So while I think it's possible, and you know, I think that the idea that just because the Jets prepared for this, that there's no way they could have panicked, I don't know that I agree with that. But the bigger question is, will the Jets be happy with their draft pick? I think that comes down much more to what Will McDonald does than anything else. And our last question, how do you feel about OTAs ending early? I personally feel this hurts the chances of late draft picks and undrafted free agents to get the work in. Should the Jets have maybe given the first team the week off so that younger players could still get the work and the coaches could get a better view of them? So if you haven't been following, Robert Sala has decided to cancel the veteran minicamp. So there's a, in the end of the every offseason program, there's a three-day minicamp where everybody's required to be there, and the Jets have canceled that this year. And the reason the Jets have canceled that is the Jets are playing in the first preseason game of the year. So the Jets have an extra preseason game this year. It's the Hall of Fame game. Every year there are two teams that have to play an extra preseason game. It takes place in Canton, Ohio, around the time of the Hall of Fame ceremony. And the reason the Jets are in the game this year is because Joe Klecko and Darrell Rivas are both going into the Hall of Fame. So two great Jets going into the Hall of Fame. The Jets were a no-brainer choice for the Hall of Fame game. Because they're in the Hall of Fame game, they have that extra preseason game. They have to report to camp a week early, which means they get an extra week of training camp. So what Robert Sala did was, we said, you know, we have an extra week of training camp. Let's just cancel this offseason thing. You know, I don't think for the young, I, I understand what you're saying. And I, I, I like that if you've been following the reports from the Jets OTAs, it sounds like they've been using the young players a lot in these OTAs. They, a lot of like young guys are getting, who are backups, who are, get, are getting first team reps. And for me, like that's the key to the offseason program. I'm not worried about Quinn and Williams. Quinn and Williams knows how to prepare for the season. But I like the idea of like younger guys who, who need the work getting those reps in offseason practices. I think that's a good thing. I think I understand what you're saying. Give the veterans a week off. Let the young guys continue to work. I think they've been doing that, though. At the end of the day, do I think three days is really going to make that big of a difference? I do not. To me, the biggest storyline about the Jets missing minicamp this year is it just means we don't we won't have to get a bunch of stories about what's the Quinn and Williams contract situation. Quinn and Williams shows up. Are you unhappy? It kind of spares us of all that drama. So I, I'm not upset with it. I, I understand the argument of, of giving the young players some more work, but you know what? They're going to get plenty of work to get an extra week of training camp. You know, at some point, I think you could. I understand. While I understand it, I think I think at some point you may fall victim to over analysis a little bit on this stuff. I don't think it matters that much. And I don't think these three days are really going to make or break any rookies or any young players still trying to develop. Anyway, that's all for today's episode. This has been the Lockdown Jets podcast, part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Your team every day is our motto. As always, if you enjoyed the show, hit the subscribe button where you're watching or listening so that you'll never miss an episode. If you're listening on a podcast source, give the show a five-star review. And if you're watching on YouTube, a big thumbs up helps us out and helps other Jets fans find Lockdown Jets. Have a great Wednesday, everybody. We'll be back tomorrow. I think you're going to enjoy the show. We're going to talk about the last good Jets team.